Now, this debate, of course, has really come to the fore because in the last decade, uh, several uh, events have uh, been the empirical material, really, for an account of hybrid warfare. And most evidently, it is Russia that has been depicted as having pursued hybrid operations, a notion that has come to the fore particularly uh, with or following the Ra Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014. Several uh, features of Russian operations in this period uh, caught public attention and the uh, eyes of policymakers and strategists uh, for what appeared quite unconventional methods and precisely for this ambiguity and ambivalence that we see characteristic of hybrid warfare. The first of these was the use of the so-called little green men. So as uh, the crisis in Ukraine ramped up, uh, suddenly uh, masked troops appeared across uh, the Crimean province. These were evidently Russian troops, and yet they bore no official insignia. They presented themselves as a spontaneous local self-defense force. And these uh, troops took over parliament, the local parliament, and various strategic sites. And, then, and within the space of a mere three weeks, a referendum uh, f had been in organized, and uh, as a consequence of it, Crimea was officially incorpor incorporated into the Russian Federation against the will of the Ukrainian government and in violation of international law. What uh, you know, was, was, was striking about this, of course, was that it was very clear to everyone that this was a Russian move, uh, that these soldiers were Russian soldiers, many of them special forces, and yet Russia had made a very concerted attempt to conceal, or at least to pretend to conceal, or make a, you know, a, a, a bare-faced attempt at concealing the, the, the real identity of these uh, soldiers in order to... Um, um, it, it resist uh, accusations that it was effectively annexing Crimea in what would of course be an, an illegal invasion. In August 2014, um, the media also began reporting that a large convoy of 300 white trucks, uh, Green Army lorries, that really in fact that had been painted white, uh, had set off from inside Russia in direction of Ukraine. Uh, this was presented by Moscow as a humanitarian aid destined for Ukrainian civilians. Um, but this aid, of course, had come without any clearance or participation from the International Red Cross, without any agreement uh, with the Ukrainian government. And so as this convoy advanced through Russia, media speculation mounted about what ulterior motive lay behind the trucks. Was this a PR coup destined for the Russian domestic audience? Was this a ploy to impose a ceasefire on the ground favorable to pro-Russian rebels? Was this a Trojan horse for bringing fuel or ammunition into Ukraine? Well, when the trucks crossed the border uh, and were shown to journalists, many were found to be almost empty, which of course only added fuel to the speculation. To this day, the mystery remains. Some have speculated, in fact, that the whole thing was itself a diversionary tactic, while equipment and personnel came into Ukraine at other points of the border. Whatever you make of it, it's this very kind of ambiguity is itself characteristic of hybrid operations. An, an ambiguity that surrounds what the operation's goal is, but beyond that, even whether there is an operation at all. And you can see why uh, this kind of tactic is all the harder to resist and to formulate a response to 
given the uncertainty around what that operation is, what it means, whether it is indeed an operation in the first place. In the last few years, of course, uh, Russia has also been accused uh, at various turns of attempting to influence the results of electoral con consultations in Western countries, um, most notably the Brexit referendum and particularly the 2016 US presidential election. In 2019, the Mueller investigation concluded that the Russian government had interfered in that 2016 election in a sweeping and systematic fashion. There is certainly substantial evidence, but most of that evidence is ultimately circumstantial. Uh, it's an accumulation of uh, facts and allegations, um, connections between um, disinformation, fake news propagation, uh, various influence operations and connections with Russia. But incontrovertible proof is much harder to come by, of course, especially when it comes to attribution. Of course, the Russians have denied it continuously. And as a result, as we've seen in the United States over the last four years, uh, in the context of the Trump presidency and the Mueller investigation, is that the interpretation of the evidence is largely determined by pre-existing assumptions. So we saw, uh, you know, on the Democrat side, uh, a ramping up of these claims, a willingness to, to, to believe any evidence or any suggestion of Russian interference, uh, very likely inflating to a large extent uh, actual, the actual Russian role uh, in the election. And conversely, on the Republican side, and of course led by Trump in particular, uh, a, a minimization or complete excul excul exculpation of, um, uh, of the Russian government. I mean, Trump, in fact, uh, you know, in the press conference saying there's no, you could see no reason why uh, or how the Russians could have had anything to do um, with, the with tampering with the election. Moreover, what we see, of course, is that these charges, charges of election tampering and, and influence operations and so on, are usually countered by uh, what we could call whataboutism. Um, and, you know, whether it comes from the Russians, which we'll say, well, what about US interference in other elections? Uh, or, in, in fact, even coming from uh, within uh, the US. And we've seen even Trump uh, uh, in, in engage or indulge in that kind of whataboutism. And that's all the more, the more easy, of course, uh, when the evidence remains circumstantial and difficult to attribute definitively, which again is the hallmark of hybrid operations in themselves. One of the interesting aspects of Russian propaganda is that it seems to be characterized by a continuous high volume dissemination of information with a very limited commitment to objective reality or even consistency. And in this sense, Russian propaganda seems to go against some traditional principles of propaganda, which is to stick to consistent messaging and seek credibility. So the idea that if you're going to vehicle a particular message, then you want to ensure that your message is consistent, uh, that you do not undermine your credibility too much so that you have a higher chance of getting your message across. Uh, this doesn't seem to be a strategy adopted by, uh, by the, the Russians. I mean, we see, for example, you know, where we see Russian denials that that really will convince convince nobody uh, because because they're they're so barefaced uh, and and uh, um, in, in, incredible. Uh, we see uh, outlets such as Russia Today, which is of course an arm of the uh, Russian state, uh, promoting various kind of conspiratorial theories and wild kinds of stories, which again uh, genuinely beggar belief. But in a sense, it doesn't seem to matter uh, in an age of rapid news cycle and short-term attention spans, or at least that's the, potentially the calculation that is being made. Russian propaganda often does not even seem invested in surface plausibility, but perhaps it is because it's playing another game. 
Russian propaganda is not being diffused because it wants you profoundly to believe that whatever the Russian government is telling you is true. Rather, it seeks to undermine uh, public confidence in all news. RT news and the output of RT news is probably not intended to be taken at face value. Uh, it's, it's clear that it's, in a way, it's pretty obvious that RT news is feeding a particular line. But in a sense, that's the effect of it, because if people start seeing, well, this is a very, this, is, this rather cruder aspect of a, of a line becomes reflected on media, other kinds of media sources. So that it seems that the Russian calculation may well be that it doesn't really matter that people don't believe what we say. All it matters is they stop believing what the other side is saying, that they believe that all news is manufactured, all news is propaganda. And that they've, if they've undermined uh, general trust in the truth uh, of, uh, of the news, then they've achieved their outcome. And in, th in this age of fake news and the generalized skepticism and cynicism that it's generated, you'd have to say that this may be a successful, at least short-term strategy. Now, in the aftermath of Crimea, various claims were made that uh, uh, a doctrine could be identified within the Russian state in the form of uh, an article uh, by in 20, written in 2013 by the Russian chief of general staff, so the highest military commander in Russia, Valery Gerasimov. Uh, and so commentators started to talk of a Gerasimov doctrine. So what do we find in this 2013 article? Well, Garamizov, Garasimov explains that in the 21st century, we have seen a tendency towards blurring the lines between the states of war and peace. Wars are no longer declared, and having begun, proceed according to an unfamiliar template. The experience of military conflicts, he continues, including those connected with the so-called so coloured revolutions in North Africa and the Middle East, confirmed that a perfectly thriving state can, in a matter of months and even days, be transformed into an arena of fierce armed conflict, become a victim of foreign intervention, and sink into a web of chaos, humanitarian catastrophe, and civil war. He's obviously here thinking very much about the Libyan intervention in 2011, a couple of years prior to his article. Finally, he argues that the role, I quote it again, of non-military means of achieving political and strategic goal has grown, and in many cases, they have exceeded the power of weapons in their effectiveness. And therefore, the methods of conflict should involve the broad use of political, economic, informational, humanitarian, and other non-military measures. All of this supplemented by military means of a concealed nature, including carrying out actions of informational conflict and the actions of special operations forces. So for many commentators, this has been seen as a template for Russian hybrid war. This is the Russians telling us what they are doing, uh, that they are blurring the lines between war and peace, that they are advocating the use of non-military means, of covert action, and so forth. In a similar line, uh, observers have pointed to a term found, or the term of non-linear war, non-linear war, a term coined uh, by Vladimir Surkov, uh, a close Putin advisor, who developed it in a 2014 futuristic short story in which he describes a world of conflict between shifting coalitions in which the belligerents can be as much a town, a province, a generation or a gender than a nation. And in which, and in which war, he says, is part of the process, but not necessarily its most important part. But there are a number of objections, I think, that can be raised to this um, notion of a Gerasimov doctrine. First of all, as I think we've already been hinted at by the extracts I read to you, Gerasimov was describing what he felt was a new Western way of war, 
You know, he refers to the Arab Spring and to the colored revolutions. And so in that sense, he was channeling a quite widespread Russian sense of being under siege by the West. So that in some ways, the, the kind of hybrid tactics that we're, that, that we're talking about are, at least in uh, the words of Gerasimov, something that Russians see as being advanced by Western states and the United States in particular. In addition, there's no indication that this article constituted anything like a coherent integrated doctrine. And there is uh, arguably a risk of depicting uh, Russia as possessing a grand master plan, a overarching strategy, an integration of everything it does, which may be really overstating the extent to which uh, Russia is operating in a homogenous, unified fashion according to uh, a grand doctrine. Indeed, the, the academic who first popularized the term of the Gerasimov doctrine has himself come to publicly regret its use, saying that it conveys precisely this misleading notion of a, of a coherent uh, doctrine uh, when no such thing really exists. Finally, there's of course a debate to be had about how much of all this is really new, and I'll explore this a bit further uh, uh, later on. But of course, the, the, the fact that it may not be entirely new could nonetheless point to uh, antecedents in Russian history of thinking in particular strategic terms about non-military means. So some have pointed uh, to the idea of reflexive control theory, uh, an idea originating in the 1960s under the Soviet Union, and which would correspond to a means of conveying to a partner or an opponent specially prepared information to incline him to voluntarily make the predetermined decision desired by the initiator of the action. So there's a, there's a literature here within the Soviet Union about this idea of reflexive control. And what this body of thinking articulates is that there should be an attempt to shape the adversary's framing of reality so that they are manipulated to take a desired course of action. This involves exploiting existing biases and inclinations within the adversary's mind so as to manipulate not just perceptions, this is not just perception management, but to manipulate the decision process itself. The basic elements of reflexive control therefore include such elements as distraction, overload, paralysis, exhaustion, deception, division, pacification, deterrence, provocation, suggestion, and pressure. Again, it's tempting for some to see in uh, reflexive control theory the predecessor the inspiration behind contemporary hybrid operations. It is, of course, much harder to ascertain uh, the extent to which such a theory uh, does guide Russian actions. One could note, in addition, that, of course, publicizing reflexive control theory, making it known that you might be using such a theory could be itself part of reflexive control since it keeps the adversary guessing whether there is a deeper play behind any maneuver. So in other words, we might want to consider whether uh, constantly having to, to doubt or to question whether anything, anything that this Russia does is part of some grand plan or some grand deception does not in itself uh, serve as a handicap on our decision processes because we are having to constantly second guess ourselves, constantly assume that there is an ulterior motive or that there is uh, you know, several degrees uh, of uh, maneuver behind every action conducted by the Russian state. China has also, in recent years, been 
well, not only in recent years, but for quite some time, been suspected of employing grey zone tactics to advance its interests. David Kilcullen speaks of the danger of conceptual envelopment, whereby one side widens its understanding of what constitutes war to the extent that the adversary remains completely unaware that they are at war. The Chinese approach, he says, entails expanding the spectrum of competition beyond that rival's capacity to cope, generating a multitude of simultaneous small challenges that hamper its ability to respond effectively to any one action, perhaps even to conceptualize the overall situation as warlike at all. So Kilcullen suggests that the Russians conduct operations more akin to liminal war, that is to say they, 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 they ride the crest of perception, the threshold of perceptibility, they push as far as they can without necessarily provoking a military response, whereas the Chinese uh, widen the scope of action, uh, compete across a variety of theatres uh, in areas which would not be thought of as domains of war at all. So accordingly, observers, officials in the West have become increasingly concerned with Chinese activity on a number of fronts in the area of technology transfer, cyber warfare, control over mineral resources, currency manipulation, uh, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, Chinese purchases of strategic real estate, uh, fentanyl production and smuggling, connecting the, the production of fentanyl to the opioid epidemic in the United States. And of course, of late, uh, even the COVID-19 pandemic has elicited theories about uh, possible biological warfare. So, of course, this is a site in which all sorts of kind of fantasies and conspiracy theories can take root. Um, uh, if, you start, if you start from the assumption that the Chinese are developing modes of war that encompass all the possible means that they could, uh, and that every action they take, even in completely non-military areas, are in fact profoundly hostile actions. There's a tendency along these lines to see the hand of the Chinese Communist Party everywhere, and with it this possible strategy of envelopment, where the West fails to understand that it is in fact already at war with China. One very concrete space in which China has been advancing its interest through mixed means short of war is in the South China Sea. So for some time, China has been incrementally advancing territorial claims over the South China Sea through a variety of measures. It's created artificial islands. It's fortified existing ones. It's occupied previously uninhabited atoll, atolls. So this kind of progressive creep, uh, creeping uh, advance into that territory in order to claim it. Uh, there's been various aggressive actions conducted against free navigation of the area uh, by supposed fishermen, Chinese fishermen, uh, in many cases um, fronts for the Chinese military. And of course, all of this is entirely denied by the Chinese military, the Chinese military has consistently uh, denied that it is doing anything of the sort, but there is considerable evidence of its ambitions and its maneuvers in this space. Again, as with Russia, it's possible to look back and to try and identify something like a Chinese tradition of war that would resonate with this idea of uh, hybrid operations in the gray, in the gray zone. Of course, in this case, we have the figure of Sun Tzu. Uh, we examined Sun Tzu briefly in an earlier session when we talked about Clausewitz in order to contrast Sun Tzu with Clausewitz. Because, of course, Clausewitz uh, has, uh, articulates a conception of war that is very military-centric, very battle-oriented, this idea of a decisive battle, of a concentration of force, uh, and with quite uh, clear delineations between peace and war. In Sun Tzu, however, we find a much more indirect approach to war. The idea that the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. A great emphasis placed on deception, 
Uh, Sun Tzu advocates being extremely subtle, even to the point of formlessness. Be extremely mysterious, he says, even to the point of soundlessness. And perhaps in, in the most evocative sense, he, he also advocates this kind of long-term strategizing, using uh, you know, subtle means that perhaps will be barely perceptible when he evokes the notion that even the finest sword plunged into salt water will eventually rust. More recently, a text from 1999 has received a, a lot of commentary. This is the text entitled Unrestricted Warfare. Uh, by the colonels Xiao Liang and Wang Xiang Sui. Very widely diffused in the West. Uh, this text uh, speaks very openly about uh, developing or, or embracing principles of warfare that no longer use armed force to compel an enemy to submit to one's will, but rather use all means, including armed force or non-armed force, military and non-military, lethal and non-lethal means to compel an enemy to accept one's interest. So within this work of unrestricted warfare, we find you know, a whole gamut of potential means that could be brought into this vision of unrestricted warfare. So there are references to psychological warfare, economic warfare, media warfare, international law warfare, space warfare, ideological warfare, network warfare, drug warfare, ecological warfare, economic aid warfare, technological warfare, and terrorism. Kao Liang, one of the authors of this um, much commented text resurfaced only last year in which he giving an interview uh, to a newspaper in which he explained that if we have to dance with the wolves we should not dance to the rhythm of the US we should have our own rhythm and even to try to break their rhythm to minimize its influence if American power is brandishing its stick it's because it has fallen into a trap Again, this idea of uh, playing, going against the grain of not of of, of avoiding or or using against one's adversary their strength, playing, competing on one's own terms. Now, it is difficult, of course, to know the extent to which uh, these ideas are reflective of general Chinese uh, thinking and strategy. Um, none of these ideas or principles are official doctrine within uh, the Chinese military or according to Chinese grand strategy. And of course, it's and it, and it is in itself, of course, significant that the West has, has for quite a long time now lent, leaned towards believing that this is precisely uh, what the Chinese uh, are doing. Let's, uh, let me talk briefly about uh, Iran, who has also in recent years been um, accused of deploying hybrid tactics, uh, specifically through its use of proxies to put pressure on the US, on Israel, or on various Gulf states, and particularly Saudi Arabia, while providing some denial of, or cover of denial uh, for responsibility uh, or any action. So we know that Iran has been involved over, over the years in supporting Hezbollah in Lebanon, has supported the Syrian regime in the context of the Syrian civil war, um, is behind various Shia elements in Iraq, uh, assists the Houthis in Yemen, and has brought to these various parties financial means, uh, personnel, and weapons transfers. There has notably in recent years been a number of drone attacks on Saudi Arabia uh, from, uh, from Yemen. Um, and similarly, uh, so, so I mean, these, these drone attacks are 
are, are typical in the sense of the what seems to be an Iranian strategy, which is to use intermediaries to get at its adversaries uh, so that it doesn't have to confront these actors uh, 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 directly. We talked recently about the uh, drone killing of uh, Soleimani, and of course Soleimani has been certainly presented by the United States as uh, a major figure in the Iranian military who has been uh, instrumental in organizing these kinds of proxies uh, and in doing so of engineering or masterminding attacks against US forces or US allies. Recently, uh, in the last couple of years or so, there have been attacks on various oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz. Um, ones that have been consistently, again, denied by Iran, um, but which the West and, and its allies very clearly identified as being uh, perpetrated or orchestrated by, uh, by, the, by the Iranians.